I feel like these videos are getting more and more casual as they go on with my outfits. Testing the mic, I'm sure the mic works. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. If you're not already subscribed, make sure you hit that subscribe button and turn on post notifications so that you never miss a video. Today, as you can tell from the title, we are doing a little more regulatory intel. We're gonna be talking about what an FDA approval is and how sponsors acquire one. So make sure you stick around and watch the entire video. I think there's this misconception that pharmaceutical companies are only in it for the money and the FDA is only in it for the money. Um, I'm here to tell you that's not true. First of all, FDA employees don't make that much money. Anyone who really works in government they don't make that much money. So there has to be a greater reason for why that person even wants to participate in that job. And I can tell you right now, it's not only for the money. On average, how long do you think it takes for a drug to get approved? I'll wait. It used to be longer than this because when I first started in regulatory affairs, people used to say it was an average of about 20 years. On average, it takes about 10 years for a drug to receive an approval from the FDA. In addition to that 10 years, it costs sponsors millions of dollars. And you have to think over the course of 10 years, if you complete a phase one study, and let's say a sponsor invested anywhere from three to $4 million in this study. If the study comes back and the drug is not effective, what do you think happens? They stop researching and developing that drug. They may continue. They may do another phase one to see if there's anything else they can do. They may explore different medications. Every company has its own different strategic development plan. But a lot of times people will just stop using that product and see if they can acquire another asset from another smaller company. And all that money is gone. That $5 million or $3 million that they spent to research that, that product for just that phase one study is gone. And they have to start over. And the clock restarts on that average 10 year time frame. So it takes a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of investment and it's a, it's a lot of work. Now moving into the FDA's checkpoints because there are many. The first one is gonna be the pre-pre-IND checkpoint, also known as Interact. And this allows for sponsors to engage in conversations early on in the development process with the FDA to discuss preclinical information or just ask the FDA for non-binding guidance on how to proceed forward with their development plan. If a sponsor requests an interact meeting and the FDA feels like the sponsor is too far along in the development process, they will cancel the meeting. They won't talk to you. And they will likely just tell you to file for a pre-IND meeting. Some sponsors like to do the interact and I always tell sponsors who are early in the development process, interact is so beneficial. You go in, you ask your questions, you're able to have conversations with the FDA prior to having your pre-IND meeting because pre-IND is gonna be a little bit more solidifying. So after you have your interact meeting, then there's the second checkpoint, which is going to be the pre-IND meeting. This is before you can conduct any trials in humans. For people who are not familiar with what IND means, it means investigational new drug. And that's an application that a sponsor files for when they're ready to conduct studies in humans. When you have an IND approval, you can begin studying your medicine in humans. Before people file for that IND, they'll go into a pre-IND meeting with the FDA. Very common early conversation with the FDA, but most people engage in a pre-IND meeting before filing. Then you have the actual IND submission. This is the third checkpoint. Sponsor submits their IND and they wait for the FDA to say yes or no. If the FDA has any issues with the information that has been provided, most likely the protocol, they may put the IND on a clinical hold. The sponsor has to address all the queries of the FDA prior to getting that clinical hold lifted. It could take a long time and it could take no time. It could be as simple as submitting a response to an information request to the FDA to address their concerns and then you move on. Or it could be more extensive. It kind of just depends. So now we're ready to do our studies. We have our IND filed and it's been approved. You now go into the next step, which is going to be the phase one. Phase one studies generally have anywhere from 20 to 80 subjects. And the purpose of the study is to put an emphasis on the product safety. Some people will do secondary endpoints looking at the preliminary efficacy of the drug, but all the FDA cares about is, is your drug safe? You wanna make sure that it's not toxic in humans and that is what the phase one study is for. Phase one is over. Finish that checkpoint, it shows that it's unbelievably safe, not toxic at all. You got a little bit of preliminary efficacy, so now you're gonna move on to phase two. Of course, you can engage in conversations with the FDA if you need to. Some sponsors finish their phase one, they prepare the clinical study report and they move on. But there's no saying that you have to talk to the FDA at any point. Most people do, as I've said, because it's just smart. <laughs> 
You don't know what's in the FDA's mind. That's what regulatory is about. You gotta think from end to end all the time. Just because you're in phase one doesn't mean you shouldn't be thinking about commercialization. You don't know what the FDA is gonna be thinking when you get to that approval process. When you're filing for your NDA or your BLA, which is a biologics license application, BLA, new drug application, NDA. And that just means that your IND has been approved for whichever molecule it is, whether it's small molecule or a biologic. You don't know what the FDA is thinking, so engaging in conversations with them is honestly just best practice. So if your phase one is effective, then you move into phase two. Phase two can only happen if phase one was successful. If phase one wasn't successful and you want to do another phase one, go ahead. If not, the sponsor has to just move on to another asset, as I said at the beginning of this video. But you can only move to phase two if phase one was successful, which means it met its primary endpoint. Now, the emphasis of phase two is going to be more on effectiveness. In all these studies, we're going to continue to monitor safety, but phase two, we want to make sure that the drug is effective. Now, these studies can include anywhere from a few dozen to 300 subjects. And after phase two is complete, this is where you need to have a meeting with the FDA. And that is what we call the EOP2 meeting, which also stands for end of phase two. The reason why it's so important to talk to the FDA at this meeting before you go into your phase three is because the phase three is your massive study. You may even have a thousand subjects in that study. You are gonna get confirmatory evidence about your effectiveness and you're gonna continue to get and collect safety data. But you wanna get buy-in from the FDA and what they're thinking, what primary endpoints, what secondary endpoints, you know, are they comfortable with the amount of patients you're, you're you're going to study? Are they comfortable with the data that you have thus far moving forward into a phase three? Is the data that we have enough, if the phase three is confirmatory, going to be enough for an approval? You kind of want to gauge where they are and what they're thinking. And there are so many different designations that can go with different applications, breakthrough designation, fast track, accelerated approval. That is something that regulatory will come up with in the strategy and figuring out how to speed up the development process. You also may have more meetings if you have like an orphan designation, which is for rare diseases. You may have more more meetings with the FDA to kind of address hurdles as they come up for you. But it's very important to have that end of phase two meeting before you go into the phase three. You'd be surprised. A lot of times, this is why sponsors have their own meeting minutes and the FDA has their own meeting minutes whenever the two meet. The end of phase two meeting always ends up coming up because the FDA will see something in the final application. It'll be like, mm, we don't like this. We don't like that. And the sponsor will come back and say, well, per end of phase two meeting, FDA told us to do this. This is what you guys told us to do. And FDA is not perfect. So the sponsor is important for them to also hold the FDA accountable and kind of put their feet to the fire when they're giving the sponsor the runaround in terms of how to conduct their studies. If the sponsor follows the guidance of the FDA, the FDA should also abide by the guidance that they gave. So these meetings are very, very important. In phase three, you may be studying different populations. You may be studying different dose forms. It just kind of depends on where you are with your product and its development. But the main purpose of a phase three is going to be to determine and solidify the effectiveness of your drug. And the study can be as large as I said, from a couple hundred to 3000 subjects. Now that we're done with our phase three, we have all our data. We've done our phase one, our phase two, our phase three. Something else I wanna highlight before I move into the next checkpoint or stage before a drug gets approved, keep in mind that these studies take forever. These Some studies are like two years long. That's why the development process is like 10 years. And then you have to think about the wait times that you have in terms of FDA approving things, wait times for meetings, making like putting up briefing books, meeting requests. There's a lot of different steps that go into it. So you have to keep all of that in mind. The next thing I wanted to highlight is actually very important. It's that the FDA, requires or used to require, but generally likes to see two adequate and well-controlled studies in order to get an approval for the drug. And what does adequate and well-controlled mean? It means the study can be replicated. They want to make sure that the first study you had in confirming the effectiveness was not erroneous or by chance. So in having two adequate and well-controlled studies, the FDA is able to see by your data that, okay, the drug works. You replicated the results, essentially, it's effective in both studies, and this gave us the confirmatory evidence that we need to feel comfortable to put your drug out in the general public. Now, of course, some sponsors don't want to do two adequate and well-controlled studies because it costs a lot of time and it costs a lot of money. It really does depend on the therapeutic area. A lot of times for diseases that don't have any approved drugs, the FDA will work with you. They now say that you can submit one clinical confirmatory study. These are the kind of conversations that you have with the FDA in these meetings prior to the, the approval process. So let's talk about a guidance really quick. In 21 CFR 314.126, the FDA lays out the regulations of what they consider an adequate and well-controlled study. I gave you a little synopsis before, but now let's break it down. Handy dandy iPad. It says, 
A clear statement of objectives of the investigation and a summary of the proposed methods of analysis in the protocol. The study uses a design that permits a valid comparison with the control to provide a quantitative assessment of the effect. The method of subject selection that provides adequate assurance that the subject has the disease or condition that the treatment is directed at. The method of assigning patients to treatment and control groups minimizes bias and assures comparability of the groups. Adequate measures are taken to minimize bias by subjects, observers, and data analysts. The methods of assessment of subjects' response are well-defined and reliable. There's an analysis of the results of the study that is adequate to assess the effect of the drug. Honestly, all they want to know, let's just, let's just put that in layman terms. The results in the first study were not by chance, okay? We are able to compare the effect of placebo in the placebo group and the effect of study drug in the intervention group. And when we're looking at these two results, we're able to see that the patients in this group, the drug group did better than patients on placebo. Now, if you have a study where the patients in placebo placebo did like weird things and it kind of looks like mm, did the placebo oddly have an effect and most placebos are like I don't know for small molecule drugs it's like maltodextrin which is basically sugar what, what, what happened there that makes the FDA get a little confused when they're looking at their data and it's like hmm I don't know it looks like something happened in the placebo group too that is basically what that that guidance is saying is like if that happens you need to do another study confir to confirm that there's a true effect of your drug in this patient population if we don't like it if it's making us feel a little uncomfortable we're not gonna approve this drug because we don't understand what's happening here and you're not able to explain to us what's happening here that is another reason why regulatory the art of storytelling the art of being able to get your point across in a way that people can understand is so important now something else that you might hear a lot is benefit risk because that is what the FDA is supposed to do they're supposed to weigh the benefits and the risk of a drug if a drug has some effect and it's very safe sponsors will want the FDA to approve it because it shows that the benefit is higher than the risk. FDA may not see it that way. It kind of just depends who you get as your reviewer, honestly, who's on your team or in these calls and what division you're going to. So now we have our phase two results. Let's say that we did two studies. Let's say we did two confirmatory studies. The efficacy was amazing. We submit our NDA. This is going to be a small molecule in this example. We wait the time frame. Mind you, also, sponsors have to do CSRs, clinical study reports, after each study. That takes a long time to write. You have, I believe, about a year to submit it to the FDA. So that also goes into this 10 year time frame. So while regulatory and other departments are doing other things, medical writing is normally working on these documents and other departments are reviewing while they're doing other work. But anyway, we're getting information queries back about little things that the FDA wants to clarify in our application. Next step is the FDA notifies us of labeling. So now the sponsor and the FDA go into label negotiations. What goes into the label? What doesn't go in the label? Type in Advil and label, FDA label on Google, or just type in any drug and type in label. There's going to be something that comes up and it's going to be all the information that people always throw away when they get their medicines. Then you get your approval, you're ready to roll. Pharma company already has their commercial commercialization team ready to go. FDA's like, yeah, drugs approved, but on your Purdue date. In the letter, FDA's like, wants you to do a post-marketing study. This will probably be discussed, so it probably won't be a surprise to the sponsor if you have to do a post-marketing commitment, because it would have come up at some time before you get your approval, or maybe not, maybe they surprise you. You can have another meeting with the FDA to discuss aspects of the post-marketing commitment. You can just do email communications with your FDA project manager, up to you, up to regulatory, how they want to navigate that, how they want to assess it. The post-marketing commitment continues to monitor safety, also efficacy and optimal use. It's called a phase four study or a PMC. And sometimes it actually can be called a PMR, which is a post-marketing requirement. Before the FDA used to be a little bit lax about this because sponsors would get PMCs and literally just never do it. But now the FDA is like, no, you have to do it. And they're following up and they're really staying on top of sponsors. And as they should, hold sponsors accountable to ensure that their drug is safe for the general public. I feel like the FDA is just trying to make sure that what actually happened in those studies is true and they get that information continually from these post-marketing commitment studies. You might see that with the COVID drug where they're continuing to monitor the safety and effectiveness. They may be doing follow-up studies. I don't know. I haven't looked into it, but that those are forms of post-marketing commitments or requirements, which are studies after approval. Phase four is always after approval. Contrary to what people believe, a lot goes into an FDA approval, a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of investment on employees part and the FDA government side and the sponsor side, the company side. Just all in all, what the FDA wants to do is ensure that the medicines that are out there have a high benefit and low risk to the patients, to the general public. I hope you found this video useful. I really do like educating you guys on how the research and development process works, how conversations with regulatory bodies go in different countries and what it really means. The next video 
I'm gonna make is what is an MAA, which is a marketing authorization application in the European Union. If you guys have any questions, make sure you leave those comments down below. If there are any other topics you'd like me to, to uncover, again, leave comments. And if you haven't ordered my the book, The Prepared Graduate, make sure you check it out. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Bye.